talked we talked about uh, Maps Prime uh, quite a bit in this upcoming episode. We actually had one of our favorite guests, Dr. Justin Brink, on talking about mobility and control. We talked a lot about the squat, uh, one of the most fundamental movements. Um, but Maps Prime uh, is uh, our program that includes a compass test, which is a self-assessment tool, allows you to identify certain issues with how your body moves, and it helps direct you to exercise sequences that you can use for your particular body. It's individualized. For your particular body to prime your workouts better. And priming your workouts better makes them much, much more effective. Uh, It's a fact. If you prime your squat better when you get in your first set, you're going to get deeper. You're going to be more connected to it. Muscles are going to fire better. And in the long term, of course, build more muscle, burn more body fat, get all those great results that you're looking for. You can find MAPS Prime at mindpumpmedia.com. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. When you sit next to Sal, you have to rub his leg a little bit. No, 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 no. <laughs> Play the old no, what no. state am I thinking of game. <laughs> you know what I mean? He had to cross uh, his leg. Uh, I get uncomfortable. Uh, uh, you do. You get a wow, little. Sal. You get a little uncomfortable with that yeah. stuff. You don't like that. A little sketchy. Uh, yeah, he huh? does. Well, I'm eyeballing I don't, you right I don't now. Really get I thought you're open minded. I get very. I get. I'm comfortable. You're open minded. I'm I'm yeah, that's, what, that's what he says. So you don't do it. But yeah. you don't believe me. I'll just take my pants off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll still rub your leg. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Whenever I rub his ears or come up and I rub his shoulders, he gets a little. Ooh, no, I don't care about the shoulders. The ears is weird. He freaks out. Yeah. It's just weird. You know what I mean? Yeah, it is. It's endearing. It's just. I've never had anybody come up and rub my ears. Hey, man. First for everything. He's like, I know you exist. <laughs> a little rubby rub. I, I agree. Yeah. Ears are a little bit different. Uh, it's, we, it, right? It is a little bit different. It's, it's, it's just straight. It would be like, well, well I'm a not- little, I'm a little bit different. So that's how that works. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, if you're a little different, you do a little different. I things. still think the weirdest thing would be like interlaced toes. Oh, how weird of that! Why? He'd be all over that. Justin, no, that for sure. Katrina hates <laughs> that. Worst. Hate so I'll fuck with her. I her laying in bed and I like sp- spread my toes around hers, and she gets all grossed out. It's like it's just oh, weird man. to her. So I, I'd love to mess with her with that. No, Stop. you can't do that. Feed with, me grapes with your toes. You can't do that with Justin because he'd fucking just, just claw you. Yeah, like, hammer you, you with my hammer toe. <laughs> he'd like uh, cut, right. fucking, he'd he'd cut you. Yeah. We got, we got we got Brinkster you. in the house today. We, we came to we brought Dr. Down, Brink. We came down, we came down to talk business and shit like that. We just put him right to work. Today. Hey, bro, Brinky get on the, in the brain. Brinky in the brain. Get on the mic. Let's talk to people. Let's help some motherfuckers out there. That's what we decided to do. So, yeah. uh, you know, we're going to talk about um the squat. I uh It's crazy. Let's go into depth. Uh, it, it, that's the thing. It's crazy right? how many people See what I did there still do this incredibly amazing exercise uh, wrong, but it's not, there's two things. There's a technique part Or they avoid it. it. Or they avoid it. There's a technique part that people get wrong, but then they learn the technique part, but then they don't have the recruitment patterns and the mobility and the the control to really do it right. So they understand the technique, but they just can't do it. I probably, I would venture to say, Dr. Brink, you're on our forum. Yep. You must get a lot of I see them. People tag you all the time on their squat. Yeah. Like watch my squat. Oh, yeah, all I the doing? time. Oh, it's it's uh it's far more complex than we than we think. We just did a huge uh video series on YouTube. How many videos did we end up doing? Was what it was it? Ten part series. Mm-hmm. Was it ten part series? Yeah, ten part series how to squat like a pro. Like a pro. And what we tried to do in the series is go through uh more in more detail, more specific. So not your typical you know, sit back with your hips and, you know, here's your foot stance type of deal. But Let, like, here's how you want to grab the bar. Exactly. Less about the mechanics of the squat and more about addressing mobility issues that most people have. So, for example, you know, there's there's many areas that could be limiting your squat, but the most common areas that are limiting people's squat, I would have to say, and Brink, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is ankle mobility, hip mobility, and thoracic mobility. Oh, yeah, and for sure. Right? Yeah. Would you say those are the most? I, I think biggest one is uh, definitely the feet, the the ankles. Yeah. You know, and that is, uh, I think that's one of the probably the most overlooked. You know, when it does come to the squat, because I mean, people squat and what do they do? They lower their head. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you know how many trainers out there tell them, okay, butt back, but they really don't understand what butt back means yeah. or what it's supposed to mean. I've yeah. noticed that you you tend to like that you zone in right away on people's feet and their ankles first. Has has that always been your go to to look at, as somebody squats? Like you really peer into to what's going on in their feet and their ankles. Uh, 
at first, it, no, it wasn't at first. It was, you know, looking at the hips. Mm-hmm. And then I think once I started realizing that, man, this pattern keeps coming up that they keep doing the same exact stuff over and over and over again. And it's not the hips, you mm-hmm. know, because again, I lay them on their back and pull their knees to their chest and they have complete no pain and 100% range of motion of their hips, you know, for, for the most part, you know, and say, so, all right, there's got to be something else going on. So I'm always asking myself, okay, why is this motion the way that it is, you know, and now looking down the chain, well, what's the first point of contact to the ground? Well, that's the feet, mm-hmm. you know, and once those feet are dysfunctional, which no one ever addresses, you know, it's always ankles up, you know, or calves up, you know, and they think, oh, I'm doing calf raises. I'm doing what I should be doing. Yeah, mm-hmm. but we need to go the other way. Mm-hmm. So starting from bottom to top, yep. uh, which makes perfect sense. Like you said, you're, you're, that's the part that's in contact with the ground. Yeah. That's what you're driving off. One thing that was uh, pretty mind blowing for me when we started working with you was really f- understanding how when you identify an imbalance or a recruitment pattern issue, when you finally identify it, it, it's never, uh, it never occurs in a vacuum by itself. Never. Yeah. It's always, of course, everything moves together. I mean, if yeah. I change, you know, the way I grip, uh, uh, you know, a barbell with my hand, it's going to change recruitment patterns uh, all the way up the shoulder and depend, it, it depends on what's moving, but pretty much up and down the kinetic chain uh, is going to be affected. So, I mean, some of the videos we did, it's on Mind Pump TV on YouTube, uh, we we looked at the ankle. We did show some stuff with the ankle. We did like the wall ankle and combat position mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Um, we did a toe squat, so we addressed uh, some you know ankle mobility and foot strength because I think that's the, the next piece, right? So first, like the ankle mobility, but then even like just the strength in your feet. Oh right? yeah. And I think uh, what was huge. I remember when you assessed me, and that was we kind of uh, talked about my feet, and then I when I started addressing, I realized realized whoa how weak my feet were and how disconnected. I was like, you know, when we were trying to do like short foot and if I was just trying to pick something up. Can like, you do short foot now? I can. Not as, I have one side that it's better than the other, but I. Were you able to do it right off the bat or no, was it? No. How weird a, was that? Yeah. It's very yeah, weird. It's it very. Sucks. Well, it's frustrating. It's, it's, and I use the analogy like, you know, imagine like you're looking at, you know, and you try and, you know, close your palm on one and hand. And you just can't do and it. And then you just can't do it on the other. It's just. It's literally, it's, it, w- it literally felt like to me, like, you know, when you fall asleep on your arm and it's like totally dead and you cannot summon it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was trying to do foot and yeah. this is, this yeah. is no joke. Staring back at you. This yeah. is no joke. Brink was telling me to do short. Abracadabra. And he was explaining it to me. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's not, that's not even a movement. I, that was in my mind. Like, you can't do that. And so he takes the shoe off and he shows me. And I'm like, what? So I tried doing it. It just didn't, it just didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing fired. The hard part. How weird is that? I think the hard part is, is learning how to, uh, and, and I feel like this is something that I'm, I'm continuing to go through myself and, and challenge my, myself and clients and people that I help out with is incorporating it into your your already normal routine because <clears throat> I find that the foot is kind of boring. You know, it's That's not very boring. It is, right? It's yeah. just not you don't have foot and day. ugly. Yeah. Wednesday's yeah. foot day. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's just <laughs> every day's foot they're day. ugly. <laughs> it's just not a sexy, sexy area to have to develop or work on. Like nobody ever tells you, like, man, you got great looking feet, bro. What yeah. do you do? Well, what exercises you do? You go to the gym and hit them you know, feet. Yeah. There's yeah. a whole I don't know, Mar- Adam, there's a whole market online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People who are into that, bro. <laughs> you would you. you would know for sure. No, like so Step on my face. You know, how do you how do you do this? This, uh, you know, you know, you got an you got an area of uh, disconnect or you're weak here. Now, how do I incorporate that with everything else in my lifestyle? And so, you know, I found that doing it sporadically through the day or like while I'm here on the podcast or you know taking my shoes off and going barefoot at home, like there, I found that I had, and I'm curious to hear all you guys and especially Brink talk about this. Like when I when he first told me, it was like, okay, great, this is a problem I have. I need to address it. And just like anything else, the first week or two, you're like, oh, I learned something new. I want to apply it. So like, I was all about it. I was like, you know, working on it, working on it, working on it. Then over time, it gets boring and it gets tedious. And then you start to kind of lay off a little bit of it. And then you realize, oh shit, mm-hmm. like if I lay off, now all of a sudden it starts to come back again. My ankle starts pronating again. I start seeing these, uh, my feet start externally rotating. I'm like, motherfucker, I can't just do it for a week and fix it. It's not like that. You know, it's something that you need to continually incorporate into your lifestyle. So I had to regress all the way back. I came out the gates gung-ho, like I think probably a lot of people do when they first learn this. And then I thought, okay, well, that didn't work very well for me. So now what, what are some simple things I can do 
And then how do I progress that uh, within my routine? And for me, what worked really well was I just, I said, okay, what I don't do enough of is just fucking walking around barefoot. I just don't. I don't mm. walk around barefoot enough. Like you. Have- now I have a question about that because uh, we've been talking about that for a while. But I've and I've been meaning to ask you, uh, uh, Doctor Brink, is it enough to walk barefoot, or should you walk barefoot with intention at first? Because and the reason why I'm asking this is because I know when I tell people to mm. do movements, like okay, just squat more, or just be, they'll just. Strengthen their their imbalance. They end up moving in yeah. their in their default pattern. Yeah. So, should you when you walk, is it enough to just walk barefoot, or should you walk with intention, or or you know change your your I guess the way your foot hits the ground or whatever? I think the first part is is we had to stand before we had to walk. Yes, right. So teach them how to stand first. Mm. Right. Go Excellent. back to go back to the complete basics. You so know, just and, walk barefoot first. Well, yeah, you're going to walk barefoot, but teach them how to stand barefoot. <clears throat> Right? Oh, I get, see. Get that connectivity when they're just standing first. And then once they know how to stand, then say, okay, this is how we want you to walk. You know, own the position of each of, you know, of your foot and then progress from there. So would you say uh, then just standing, if I'm standing at work or I'm sta- just focus, you know, throughout the day while I'm standing to, to activate those, those yeah. patterns? Yeah, simple. You know, I give the, the, the example. Triangle, right? Yeah, it's a triangle, the tripod. Mm-hmm. You know, the fat pad of your heel, big toe, small toe. You know, there's a little triangle in that spot. Oh, whoa. You want to have equal Well, let's talk about that weight. for a second. Hold yeah. on. So you want to do what with the with the heel? So as you're, as you're standing on the ground, again, you are trying to create this little tripod on the bottom of your foot. Okay. So on the bottom of your foot, you've got your heel, you've got the fat pad of your big toe, fat pad of your small toe. So if you draw a line between those three, it creates a triangle. Mm. If you can center your weight over all three points, then you know that your body is probably going to be pretty much centered. Mm. You know, And if your body is centered over your feet, there's where your mass is going to be able so to in, accept weight better. You're more centrated, if you will. And you can identify, too, like where, uh, like, let's say they've they've added more calluses or like oh, more sure. like bunions and, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so if... That that's an obvious sign of where you need to focus a little bit more on, say, like bringing your big toe into the into the grounding process, yep. standing up. Yep. Okay. Well, okay. not even not even bringing the big toe into it, but you know, because a lot of them are using the big toe, mm-hmm. right? So using the big toe, and you see a lot of grippers, you know, and so that big toe is really hooking into the ground, ah, uh-huh. right? So if they're hooking into the ground, and then that's the last point of contact, and they have that callus on the inside of that big toe, mm-hmm. right? You know that that's the point that's leaving the ground last all the time, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like calluses on your hand. Why do you have a callus on your hand? Because you that's the point that you're using when you're gripping a bar, mm-hmm. you know. Well, your foot's doing the same exact thing. So just pay attention to that. Yeah, pay attention. Again, you want to try and center them because if they're now pushing through the center of their foot versus off the big toe, there's no reason that big toe should be drifting off, you know, in that hallux rigidus or hallux valgus is, is what it's called. Mm-hmm. So so now you make me feel a lot better about this this whole idea that how I regressed this and then I started to progress. Oh, and that's yeah. why I said, okay, I started with barefoot. Just fucking get barefoot yeah. more because that in itself, you'd be, a, you'd be a surprise how many people – just never take their shoes off till sure. they're ready to get in bed. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, we walk around. So I said, okay, I'm going to start with just being barefoot more. So take the cast off first. Yep. You know what I'm That's saying? It. Take the cast yeah, off yeah. first. Get reconnected with earth. And and so that was the start. Then, yeah, man. then I progressed to kind of like where Sal was going, where it was like, okay, now let's be more aware of how I'm standing on that tripod mm-hmm. and then how I'm walking. And another little area, which I, for, for all my men that are listening, uh, pay attention when you stand up and you pee at the urinal. Sure. <laughs> so I actually will, when I'm standing in it, every time I piss, so I pee a lot throughout the day because I drink a lot of water. So I thought, okay, here's another easy way that Nothing I can be with your prostate, getting, so getting re- reconnected here and, <laughs> and paying older. attention to how I stand. Okay. I'm going to, every time I'm standing at this journal, I'm going to pay attention to right away my feet. And it's surprising, but right away when you go to do something else, right? So I'm peeing here, you, you'll you see your feet will, you know, if you have a pronate or externally rotated yeah. with that, all of a sudden we'll get into that position because you're focused on your you dick. You fall back into the comfort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you are. Right? Dick, dick, dick takes priority. It does. The dick and where you're, and then where yeah. you're shooting, right? Because for guys, right. you know, they have the little target on all the urinals. You guys know that, right? So yeah. they, they put that for yeah. a reason, oh, yeah. right? We just naturally are like targeting. So all of a sudden you're, you're worried about your pee target and you forget about your feet. So for me, I've just, just don't pee on your feet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep the hose you yeah, know, yeah, in line. Yeah. 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 So and even if you're not, Fireman I'm drills. not saying to go to the. So let me back up here because I know someone's thinking. Oh wait a second. So are you saying that you go to the, the public restroom without your shoes? No, I'm not going to the public restroom without my shoes on. <laughs> yeah. But I'm I'm thinking inside about it. Your shoes. Inside of my shoes, I'm paying attention to that tripod that Brink is talking about, 
and I'm just trying to make sure that I'm aware of that. That actually took some practice because you'll be mindful of it the first few times, and then there'll be a lot of times where you walk over the urinal and you got other things on your mind and right away. Mm. And so just training myself to every time I pee, make sure I'm standing on that tripod every single day, Mm -hmm. spending 20 to 30 minutes with my shoes off being connected to the ground and then how my feet are. That right there, I'm telling you right now, I've seen a huge progression already from that. And it's simple. It's easy. It's it's something that I can build upon too. So I think that's a mistake that uh, I've made at first when I found this this new knowledge that Brink brought to us, which was, dude, look at your feet, address that, then work your way up. And so I was like all excited with this new information and I'm like applying all these exercises and stuff. And then what happens? They all start to fall off because mm-hmm. I everything else becomes a priority. Another so, bit of uh, Schaefer knowledge there. You wash your hands before you touch your dick. Yes, that's yeah. right. Not after the rest. Especially of before you touch I, mine. I, yeah. I yeah. think also going, going back to what you had mentioned before is you just taking your shoes off for some people, that in itself is like mind blowing. Mm-hmm. Because they wear shoes all the time, right? And they don't understand the connectivity to their feet to the ground. And what they don't understand is, I want to like the feet have like something like four hundred thousand receptors on the bottom of them. Yeah. How many are now shut down because all they've been doing is wearing shoes and socks their entire life? Well, how, how much how do your you brain feel about is shut insoles? down? Because sure. Of, yeah. How do you, you feel know? about insoles? Uh, saying well, that. So again, some people do need insoles. Yeah. You know, I'm not for them. You know, mm-hmm. out the get go, I want you to get your feet to work for you. Uh, you know, Dr. Emily Spiegel, she's developing a insole that actually has little vibratory things in them or not, vi- or, uh, I don't even know what they are like little nodules. Ooh. And so it's to create stimulus on your feet, you mm-hmm. know, and that in itself is pretty amazing. You know, if you can create that stimulus inside your shoe all day long, yeah, it's definitely going to help uh, you out. Well, here's one thing I noticed for myself because I'm, I'm, I was, I used to wear socks to bed for God's sakes. I used to wear shoes and socks all the time. <laughs> And one thing I noticed about myself is I've always been extremely, extremely ticklish on the bottom of my feet, like extremely ticklish. Ooh, and I know. realized one day while Justin was was playing with my toes, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I realized that the the reason <laughs> why I ma- the reason why I may be super ticklish on the bottom of my feet is because uh, the parts of my brain that process that sensor, the, you know, the, the the sensation from yeah. the bottom of my feet is undeveloped, so it's. There's no uh, desensitization. N- n- so it's too much. Yeah. It would be like it would be like always wearing really dark sunglasses all the time. Always, always, always your whole life. And then taking them off and this all all light is too bright. That's yeah. a great analogy because it's not like you can't see anymore. It's not like you can't feel with your feet before. They're right? too they're too it's, just, it's too, sensitive. too sensitive. I'm yeah. perceiving uh the bottom of my feet as being too sensitive. So the so like when I walk on like gravel, it's like, oh, oh I can't I can't walk. It, it hurts too much. Whereas I see little kids and oh, they you know, do it all the time. And people are always barefoot, just running around all the time. Yeah. I realize for myself, I can't. It's just too sensitive, and so that's one of the other the advantages of going barefoot is you develop your your the parts of your brain that work with that, and so and and that's got to contribute to other things. You know, it's got to. I'm sure there's some carryover, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, think about the the you know what would happen to you if you again if you lost use of one of your arms or one of your legs, right? Yeah. You start to lose the the the, the those connections in the brain. So. So when going you, back to the squat, yeah. you know, with your feet, you know, is where now you can root your feet to the ground, right? And where people just don't normally think that, right? That's not the first thing, you know, with you guys as being trainers is you're not sitting there saying, root your feet to the ground first. It's like, no, butt back, mm-hmm. right? Well, no, let's, how about we root your feet first so we get that connectivity? You know, it's that ground force reaction. I'm pushing on the ground, ground's pushing back. What's that going to do? That's going to connect your hip. Your hip is now turned on. You have now your deep pelvic floor that's turned on. You get your glutes that are now working how they're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And now put your butt back. And now let's see what type of connectivity you have in that in that proper squat. So let's talk about uh, like step one. Step one when someone doesn't have – and it, it could be anywhere, right? Feet, hips, knee, whatever. But when they don't have connectivity to the point where you tell them to activate a, a movement or a muscle and it just doesn't even happen. No, you know, not not poor connection, like no, almost no connection. What's the first step that that person can take to get some connections so that they can finally start doing exercises for that particular I've, area? I, I see it a lot when I'm doing like some ACL reconstruction. You know, mm. or not reconstruction, but the the rehab post, you mm. know, uh, surgery, and like the VMO, you know, vastus medialis just doesn't fire. You know, so they look at it and they can contract one side and the other side just does nothing. Wow. You know, so it's like, all right, stare at that thing and I want you to do quad sets. You know, I really want you. So what's a quad set? Quad set is just contracting your quad. Just flexing it. Yeah, just flexing it. How long can you hold it for? One second, two seconds, 10 seconds. You wait till you see some stimulus and then, 
over time, as you keep trying to rebuild that connectivity, right, they're going to start to fire a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Pretty soon now we can start to load them. Other than that, if there's no fire and there's no connectivity, there's no reason to do an exercise. You're just, mm-hmm. you're an injury waiting to happen. Now, do you ever do uh, a couple questions? Do, do STEM machines help with that at that point, help them get connection or is that not help at all? So STEM machines, there's a lot of STEM machines that are out there. There's, you know, your interferential, there's your microcurrent, there's your Russian STEM, you know, there's, yeah, there's, there's so many that are out there. That's the hard part. Russian stim is the one that has been shown to actually create uh, or prevent atrophy. Mm. Um, and Russian stim, it came from, I think, like the 60s when the Russians were in the Olympics. And that's mm. what they were using to try and help with their with their muscle building techniques. Um, you know, with the TENS unit. TENS unit is just blocking like a pain gate theory. Um, microcurrent is going after more maybe an inflammatory marker. You know? Now, does it help? Do they help get a connection, though? Like, let's say I have trouble retracting my shoulders because... I got a b- poor connection to my rhomboids and mid trapezius. Would putting stim on those areas uh, help me f- to feel and connect to those muscles that so that I then I can like, do it on my I own? I feel like you're bypassing the brain and and you're creating an artificial brain, so you're really well. Not. That's what that's what my that's it's, what my question it's a, is. It's a, it's a temporary connection that you're making right. through an outside it's not stimulus, internal, it's external. So yeah. and you're really trying to work on the brain muscle connection. Well, I'm, there, right? so here's what I'm thinking, right? I'm thinking that's why I'm asking that question because I I know that part, but I'm wondering if using the stim will help you feel what it feels like to flex it. And you know, some, after that, you could kind of like reproduce yeah, that internally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like you can't find. You know, yeah, uh, sometimes I'm using my, you need like stimulus to. to oh, I can, I can uh, look, tap into. I'm that. using myself as an example with short foot. Hmm. I can't even find the muscles to do it. Right. I couldn't even find them. Like I know where I can see them with my eyes, right. but I can't even find them. And it reminds me of like when I would train clients and I would tell them to contract a particular area, and it would always help if I just touched it with my finger. Hmm. So they had the external. Yeah. Stimulus, and then they could be like, "Oh, right there," and then uh, they could kind of identify, you know, identify where they need to squeeze. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? So that I think sense. I think with you touching it, right, then they can say, "Okay, this is where I need to go to," because mm-hmm. it's that stimulus where mm-hmm. I think. And this is just all anecdotal on my end because I, I don't know, you know. Mm-hmm. So anecdotally, if if we put stim on you, it's the machine doing your finger's job, okay. mm-hmm. right? So now is the brain telling you, or is it that electrical impulse that is firing, you know, mm-hmm. at that spot? And then once you take it off. You still don't know what that is. Okay. You just wouldn't know it be where those just pads more yeah effective to just literally use your phone fingers yeah. and just and poke just, at it. Yeah, just touch it. And yeah. You just try and get it to fire. Mm. You know, or brushing. Uh-huh. You know, for that matter. Okay. And that's where again we go back into like a taping. You know, where you can oh, tape. Right. You know, taping mm. is going to help out because it's a better communication to the brain. It's something that's on the skin itself, which is a huge you know sensory receptor just in itself. And if we're touching that area, and now it's telling the brain there's something there. Let's get that spot to fire. Hmm. Where would you use? Where would you find uh, e-stim useful then? More recovery, Atro- atrophy, I, right? Well, again, I think it depends on where you're at. When I first started ten years ago, you know, we used stim on every single person that walked through the door because it was like, wow. oh, you have it on your neck, <laughs> on your back. It was like, here, I'm going to put you down here. I'm going to cook you for ten minutes, yeah. put a hot pack on you, and then we're going to do some rubby dubby on you and adjust you. You know, <laughs> so I've been to uh, somebody who still does that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah. So that's oh, why man. that's why I left. Rubby you know, yeah. I just didn't agree with that. You know, oh, I saw man. everyone come through and they got cooked for ten or fifteen minutes and we rubbed on them and then we adjust them and I don't see you, I'll see you in two and days. You nailed it. It's like, there. That's yeah. stupid. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Now, what was the theory behind that? What did they think they were really doing? Well, well I, don't, I don't know what their theory is. I think it's more of a billing purpose on my end. Oh, you wow. Know? But, I see. you know, it is, it, it, they feel good because Hell they get to- people mad at you right now. Well, they get to come in and they get to lay down for 10 or 15 minutes <laughs> and feel it's good. Relaxing. You know, yeah, they yeah, get to relax. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's more like a massage like parlor than it is anything else. Well, uh, yeah. You're not really correcting much. You're just well, kind of I so, think so, temporary. So there is. There is benefits, you know, let's say acute issues. Let's say an ankle issue. You know, someone comes in, they roll their ankle. Yeah, it's going to help sort of pump some of the swelling out of there. Uh, that That's good. You know, does it help decrease some of the pain? Sure it is. But I could kick you in your other shin and you're going to figure out the pain that you have anyways. <laughs> right? So I think it's just we're trying to bypass that pain point. You know, so they feel better once they leave. Mm. Here's you know, the, here, what's the long term so studies? You, I really don't think there's well, really long term studies. Here's on how it. I look at that kind of stuff. The way I look at it is like massage, for example, if you look at a good massage therapist, without any other, uh, you know, uh, additions in terms of techniques or exercise or whatever, can massage alone help in the long term? Now, I think it can. I think by itself, it's not super, it's, it's not nearly as effective as if, when you combine it with other things. But on its own, maybe it would help the person move differently now, 
which then will change the recruitment pattern. And I think that may be what the chiropractors of old were doing was let's, let's adjust you, let's massage you. Now you're moving dif- differently. And some people, that may help them long term because now that they're moving differently, they create different recruitment patterns. But it was incomplete, right? Because you didn't have them showing them the right exercises, how to connect, how to, how to correct those recruitment patterns. Yeah. Because when you combine all of that, man, now you've got... Yeah, there was no there was no intent post treatment, right? Mm-hmm. Right. It was treatment was here. You got it. You feel better. You leave. We see you in two more days, mm-hmm. right? So the intent for them to move better was never there because they were never educated how to move better. Mm-hmm. Their body dictated how they moved based on their muscles being either tight or relaxed. So if they're relaxed, they're moving a little bit different than they did before. So yes, they are going to move different. Sometimes worse than what they did before. Well, this right? is where because, we see a big gap too with physical well, therapy sure. going into to training in the gym. Right? Yeah. there's that whole process. I think there's a gap between all of healthcare. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and and all of healthcare is is missing the movement component to it. You know, and they're missing the the part of here. Let's teach you to do something better for yourself. Mm-hmm. You know. You need to have the intent for yourself, not come in and get the drug from me, the the simple six step exercise to make your back feel better, the adjustment, or you know, go in and get a massage therapy. You know, uh, you know. Well, this is a good to topic because I feel like this is a big a big step that people just skip right over in, in general as far as like trying to get muscles to fire first, right? Like like learning that process of connectivity and and mm. learning how to to feel your body and feel the response you're I supposed to get. That's the key. Feel your body. Yeah. No one no one understands their own body. I mean, you said it, you know, Sal, yeah. you know, about your foot. You sat there and stared at your foot and yeah. did nothing. Yeah. You know, so you're highly connected to your body. You're just missing a, you know, a large component to what's going on. And mm-hmm. that's that's the foot. You mm-hmm. know, we talk about gut health. How many people actually pay attention to what's going on in their gut or no in their one. brain? Or I mean I mean there's so many different avenues mm-hmm. that we can take on that. We want to go to someone and let them fix our problem. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the biggest things I tell people. I'm not here to fix you. Yeah. You will fix you. Well, that's why it's so frustrating you know? when people come so, to see you, right? Yeah, and, and if they don't like what I say, yeah. they never come back. You know, you it's, know? It's, so. it's, it's funny because you're right. I mean, Western medicine does that, right? You get very specialized in one area, and then that becomes your scope. Yeah. And you forget about all those other areas. I actually had a conversation the other day. I don't remember where I was on Instagram. And I had commented, someone had asked me something about, uh, you know, how food can affect their skin. You know, like they break out or whatever. And so I was talking to them and then boom, a dermatologist gets on there. There's no evidence to show that avoiding certain foods will make acne get better and blah, blah, blah. Food, it really has no impact on your skin. And I mean, I know that they believe that, but how can they believe that? It's got to be one of the most bullshit things I've ever heard in my entire life. How can what you eat every single day not impact everything. Yeah, everything in Everything. Your, body. your mood, your fucking eyesight, yeah, your, your fucking, brain, everything. your brain, your skin. Like, are you really going to tell me what I eat doesn't affect yeah. my skin? It are literally you makes that, up your mass. Like, it just, your body's it's matter. Just, it's just insane. And we actually had this conversation yesterday about movement and how people don't think that movement can affect how you feel uh, emotionally or mentally. Of course it does. There's yeah. a whole feedback loop going on there. What do you think feedback- yoga is supposed to be doing? <laughs> you know, or Pilates or any of that type of stuff that's out there. You know, why do why do kids feel amazing all the time? For the most part, <laughs> yeah. these days they don't because they're out freaking playing all the time. Yeah. They're out mm-hmm. moving. Yeah. You know, how many of us actually go move? If we went to go move and we just did something for an hour, you know, besides get off, you know, sit on the couch and be like, oh, I'm too tired, I can't do it. You'd feel freaking better. So let me add, so on that uh, on that particular uh, topic, um, Let's talk about the squat since yeah. we're on that topic of the squat. How fundamental would you say is being able to squat or how sit in a squat how for a human being? Well, it's a fundamental process. You should be able to squat. Mm-hmm. Every single kid does it. Every you look at, you know, populations, you know, Asian population, African, you know, Hispanic, you look at a lot of these populations, that's what they do. Mm. Right? Whether they're sitting in the fields or sitting by a campfire. Western society, we don't squat anymore. We sit 90 degrees and we wonder why we can't go. And then, yeah, I can't go. Dude, this oh, is, yeah. a, this about is the a dis- part that drives me fucking crazy. Though. Like my my best friends, dude, that we grew up since childhood together. And I see this happening where, and uh, th- and I know they're the majority where people just, because they can't, they and, and, and that kind of almost feels like it happens overnight because you don't really pay attention, right? Like if you're young, you're playing sports, you're doing all that, then all of a sudden like life hits, right? Mm-hmm. You get married, you have kids, you get a job, you're sitting in a desk all day long. Then all of a sudden 
you know, 30s roll around or whenever, doesn't matter, right? It rolls around that you decide, oh shit, I need to start exercising or doing something to fix this. And then all of a sudden they realize- it's like makeup process. Well, yeah. then they go then they go to do like a squat or do something and it hurts. You know, I just got, an, I just got a post or an inbox from somebody saying that, you know, they're following MAPS Anabolic, they're like 50 years old and their knees hurt. What are something, what other movements can I do instead of the squats and the deadlifts? Squat more. Yeah, right. And so <laughs> this is the, and this is hard for us uh, virtually. This has been one of, this is part of what uh, motivated us to do the podcast where we can explain ourselves more because- I, I, I know that if I gave that, like the, the old trainer in me, the 22-year-old version of me, would give them some fucking easy exercise to do in replace of the squat so that yeah. that could build their legs still or, you know, work work their hamstrings. Feed to or their quad. comfort versus, you know, what they need. Exactly. But then the, you know, older me knows that, oh, my God, I'm doing more of a disservice to them by yeah. just answering that question the way they want me to answer it. What I need to tell them is like, no, that's a big flag for you that this is an area we need to approve upon. Let put the brakes on. Let's let's address this and work on this specifically yeah, now. But what, what, what I what I think though is people don't want to think, right? They they don't want to think about what they should be doing. Yeah. You know, my knees hurt when I squat. Okay, you know, if you want to go be a better cyclist, you're not going to go be a runner. Right. Go cycle more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's not rocket science, but they want to do that. Like, oh, my my knees hurt. Well, why? Why do your knees hurt? What's going wrong? Well, you and, know? and this goes back to, you know, first also being aware with what is it you really want and then actually trying to connect people about connect people to health and wellness versus this always being aesthetically driven because most people who bought a program or decide they're going to start to exercise, it's driven like because they feel fat or they're not happy with the way they look. And so then they hire a trainer or they buy a program and then the program has movements in there that they can't do and then they want a replacement for those movements instead of going like, whoa, this is a big deal. Like these are basic movements that everybody's body should be capable, barring that you don't have some crazy fucking sure. limitation, like you're missing a part of your limb or you had a major- Or something's torn or whatever. Yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. Like, there's exceptions to sure. the rule, but for the majority- they, they they go to do these movements, they can't, or it hurts, or it bothers them, and then they look for a replacement right away just so they can just keep trucking towards this goal. It's it's just, for me, it's insane because when you look at the squat, it is uh, it is so fundamental to human movement. It, look, at the, the squatty potty, you guys know what that is, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. That's that little step stool that you put your feet up when you yeah, sit in a toilet and poop. And it works. It, cl- it actually works. There's studies to show that using a squatty potty we should put that in the show notes at the end of this one. Now that I'm selling it, yeah. but, YouTube video. Uh, yeah. it, it, <laughs> using, a, YouTube. using a squatty potty no, helps people have better bowel movements. But it's not the invention of the squatty potty. It's, it's the because anatomy. It's, the, it's, it's sitting in a squat yeah. puts you in the right pelvic tilt. It relaxes the muscles that open the colon and allow you to use the bathroom. That's how we pooped for most of human wow. civilization. You know, you just it's, you just reminded me of something that I want to ask Brink while we have him here because that plays into the big debate over the butt wink too. So there's this there's this big argument in the fitness world right now with squatting that when you go below ninety, that you, the the pelvic starts to tilt okay. forward. And for some people, for, well, for most, if you at most people, if you sit all the yeah, way down, depends on where what angle that you're at, but right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have this kind of natural tuck yeah. when you get to the bottom, which is that's what allows you to poop better, right? That's what opens that up. As soon as that rotates mm-hmm. and tilts like that, that opens up that canal, and right, now you can shit right. better, right? So, but you saying you saying that it's funny because I do have clients, some Indian clients, right? That I and when we show them how to squat, like. Oh, yeah, that's what we used to do. We used to go take a crap in the street or something. <laughs> oh, no. oh, all right. Well, there you go. See? You need to think about do that, that next again. time you squat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, do you, Just don't now, let it out. How, well, so there's a debate, right? There's a debate. Some, some people say uh, if you have a butt wink, you need to correct it so that you don't have a butt wink. And other people are saying, no, a butt wink for some people is structurally how their body moves when they get that low. There's n- it has, it's a structural thing. It has nothing to do with, for some people, it has nothing to do with and I'm, ge- and I'm guessing, Brink, you're going to say there's both sides. I think I, there's both sides. Right. Uh, you know, you can look at, do you have tension in that upper hamstring? Hmm. That right, when you're getting to that lower point, is it tugging, sort of pulling, you know, you under at some angle, you know, that you're finding that? Do you have a lumbar instability, you know, L5S1? You know, so if you're losing stability, what's going to happen is other mm-hmm. muscle going to, re- you know, recruit, and you're going to tighten up, you know, whether it's now your psoas pulling anterior fibers, is it, you know, again, hamstrings, is it your glutes working differently, is it your quads? You know, yada yada yada. You know, do you have control over the movement? 
So, so what what are some simple tests or things that you do when you see that? So let's say I, I drop down into a squat, I hit below 90, and I have what might look like a butt wink, but maybe it's right on that borderline where it doesn't look excessive. You're not too sure. What would be the first like go to test or way you would assess borderline me butt wink to, <laughs> to to figure hey. out? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go make sure that you have control of your lumbar spine first. You okay. know, do you can we go into that cat? You know, cat camel, and then create more of that like a uh, segmental spine. Mm. You know, can you get the intrinsic muscles to work? If you own sort of that movement and you're still butt winking. In my opinion, you own your spine. Mm. Everything else, oh, whatever. You know, Ooh, I'm okay. Ooh, that's a good one. So, you know, if you can get yourself still down there and you're still butt winking, but yet I know that your spine is safe, I'm okay with you getting down there. So that's, see, that's a good point there. That's what um, I wanted to ask him. There's I, a good point there. It's, like uh, it's, it's about owning the movement yeah. versus the movement owning you. Correct. Uh, it's like that. It's like when I, well, I'll, I'll present an exercise, especially when I do core exercises, people lose their fucking mind because I'm showing people how to go into yeah. posterior pelvic tilt and activate their core and everybody freaks out. And really it's about owning, uh, owning that particular position. I'm not falling in that position. You know what I mean? I'm not letting my ligaments support me. It's my muscles that are supporting me. Yep. So that's basically yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. saying. Yeah. Uh, what about like the upper thoracic area? Cause I feel like you could have good control in the in the lumbar and the hips, good mobility, and and maybe you don't have a butt wink, but the but because your thoracic curves, could that contribute to a butt wink as well? Uh, I wouldn't see why it could not. Okay, you know, but now you're working up the chain. Yeah, you know, so maybe it can. You're probably going to be not even worried about the butt wink at that point because mm. you're so far leaning forward, it doesn't make a difference because mm. mm. you don't have the extension necessary to sit as upright as you need. Yeah, because with a with like a, a resistance training barbell squat, we've now added another component, right? We're not just squatting body weight. We're actually supporting a barbell yep. behind our back. And in that case, you want good scapular mobility and yep. good thoracic you yep. know, mobility. Yep. In order and to do and that. I see a lot of guys – you know, especially like on the Facebook and stuff where, you know, they're posting their squat and they're wanting me to look at like their hips and I'm going to comment on their shoulder. Because yeah. I see one, you yeah. know, one hand that, you know, the wrist is straight and the other one is cocked. So again, it leads me to believe that, well, maybe their shoulder mobility on that left-hand side, right-hand side, you know, is just not what it should be. Mm. So can they squat with their wrists sort of in that parallel position all the way up, all the way down? And they'll notice if they can't, you know, they go, I'll take them as low as they can go until they start losing their wrist and then just hold that spot. You know, and squeeze harder, pull harder, try and put themselves in that corrective position. You know, we we recently were asked uh, on the podcast. We just did a Q and A, and they somebody asked like the things that we are focusing on, each of us individually. And I was kind of vague about what I've been doing, but the more I think about it, this has really been like the major goal for me over the last year has been just like perfecting my squat and why I did it that way because I this is just how I this is how my brain works right like I, I I tend to have to have like some sort of a goal it's like when I competed it's like I that was easy right it's like I had to get in the best shape of my life and be down to body fat so you know I just go 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 till I reach that point well now for me uh my workout and my programming is completely centered around getting better at my squat and it's crazy how many little things that you like. I, I mean, I think the average person might look at my squat and go, "Oh, it's a pretty good squat now." But it's really to me, it's I see now. I see all these things that are going on. Like I still don't have the shoulder mobility. My wrists are still breaking. You know, sure, I'm getting. I got away from my ankle pronating. I have good connection now with my feet. I have great hip mobility, so I'm getting good depth. The tracking of my knees lined over my. You know, so these things are starting to come together. But as one thing comes together really well for me, and then I start to realize another area that has to be addressed. So I think instead of being frustrated, I think the reason why I'm sharing this is to have people be okay with, hey, I, you can't squat very well right now. But instead of just chalking it up as you can't do it and avoiding it and going to something else, maybe treating that as a, as a goal in itself and a way to program. And that's really like how we designed Prime was Prime was designed so people could see areas where there's dysfunction and say, okay, these are your fortification sessions. These are your mobility drills. These are these things that you are that you need to integrate into your workout and potentially become mainly your workout. Sure. So, you know sometimes the tests are the exercise. Right. Yeah. And that that and that's kind of what that came from you. You know, that was something that you really tattooed uh, you know, you I remember when you were first like showing me all the stuff that had going on. And right away the my trainer brain goes, Okay, well show me all the movements that I need to do to get better. 
you know, so I can pass this test, you know, that's the competitive side of me. And then you're like, well, sometimes you just need to just keep doing the test. Like you just yeah. keep, keep doing that. And that's part of it. And I think about like, wow, that's so true. Like I don't, you don't have to overcomplicate it sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes just putting a, a barbell and getting it in that position and then like doing s- squats with no weight on there. And then, then addressing each one of those areas we're talking about. So I'll squat down and go like, oh, wow, my wrists are breaking. Uh, I don't, I'm, my, I'm slightly rounding forward. My left ankle is kind of pronating. Okay. So boom, barbell gets re-racked. Now I go down I start priming some movements, doing some of my drills, go back, do it again. Oh, look, this is still happening. These movements, this go back, do it. You know what I'm saying? And just, right, it's just going through the checkpoints. And then as you go through the checkpoints, you see what stands out the most. And then that's where you can kind of go spin off of that and work directly on, say, it's a shoulder mobility issue. You know, let's really address that a bit deeper. And, uh, you know, that's why sometimes it's hard for people to, to just slow down. And to notice all those things, they just want to rip through the reps and get through the workout. Well, there's too much noise going on. Yeah. Right. They're, again, they're not they're not paying attention to them. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're not listening to what their body's actually telling them. They bypass that. I I've been told I got to do this. Right. Yeah. And that's all I have to do. And I can't do this, so I'm going to do X Y Z. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on here. You know, just back up a little bit. Yeah. You know, just try this and show me that you own that first. And let's go to B. And then let's go to C. And then let's go to D. Right. Mm-hmm. But they get so frustrated because they can't pass A, they just give up. Right. Yeah. So. And, and I think that's a lot of what, so if you don't have Prime, obviously Prime was designed, the program was designed for this, but if you didn't have Prime, we we did this YouTube series and this was kind of the direction we are were, we were trying to go with it was, okay. Which by the way, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, I mean, there, we do a, a new video every single day. So this was a whole series that we did yeah. on this particular topic, but we went into things and details that you don't see uh, for almost anywhere else. I mean, these are videos that we saw nobody was making. So it's a lot of the stuff we've learned with with Dr. Brink and things that are not like your typical, you know, sit back when you squat and, you know, do your box squats and that kind of stuff. It's it's not typical at all. No, and we wanted to give things, you know, <clears throat> practical things that you could take, you know, so you do your squat and you realize that the, the, here's an area that you don't have good mobility or you can't perform the squat without these things happening. So here are some simple movements that we'll address. And we just, we honed in on like three of the major areas, like we've been talking about the whole thoracic mobility, the ankle mobility and the hip mobility. That's not to say other issues could, and you know, we have plenty more YouTube videos that we can do, but I thought, you know, we came together and said, Hey, we talked about all the different clients that we trained over the years and the issues that they have. And like, what are the most common things that we have to fix and address? Let's pick a handful of movements that we give to these people so they can start to help this or get reconnected to these areas or disconnected. And so that's what the YouTube series was all about. So one thing you said, uh, uh, Dr. Brink, um, j- about five minutes ago was when someone is doing a squat and you were talking about when the wrist breaks or whatever, to go down until that happens and then just become, you know, better connected to that. Yeah. What do you mean exactly by that? Like what, let's say I'm getting into a, a position and I'm trying to become more connected within that position. What am I focusing on? What am I doing? Like, how do you explain that? Well, I know for that person, if it's a wrist issue, shoulder issue, elbow issue, they're not thinking about that anyways. They're just, they're thinking about how low can I get into my squat? For me, I'm like, no, no, no. I want every part of your squat to work for you at hundred percent through every range of motion that you're trying to achieve. So if, if I know you can get down, then, Hey, let's get you down into that position, but let's make sure everything is correct in that entire position. You know, let's make sure your head is retracted. You're not turtling through the neck. You know, let's make sure your shoulders are retracted. Let's make sure you've got good movement through your elbows, through your wrists. So you're not, you know, pinning your wrist, you know, underneath the bar, you know, or your, you know, your left side, you're, you know, rotating out a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. So the slower you go, the harder it is. We don't like to go slow. So are you doing like a checklist? Like if I'm sitting at the bottom of a squat, I'm doing a checklist. This is what I do at least. Uh, I'm doing a checklist. I'm going like, okay, feet, you know, boom, like ankles, knees, hips, you know, usually, back. At the, usually at the bottom of the squat, though, it's too late because if you already failed and you've already failed at the bottom, I'm going to work top down. So go, so go down until you're yeah. Okay. yeah. So feel your body. You know, when you are squatting, where do you feel some asymmetries at? Can you see yourself in a video? Do you have someone that's watching you? Mm-hmm. Watch you from the front. Watch you from the side. Watch you from you know from the back. Where do they see that you know an elbow is tucking you know on the left side, the right side? Where do they see you rotating out? Where do you see your feet starting to rotate out a little bit more? Slow yourself down and start to work those movements and try and prevent that that you know abnormal mechanic and try and work on correcting that mechanic. Now, something that was uh, cool for me to kind of learn from you was the difference between range of motion and control. Yeah. Would you mind explaining that a little bit? I mean, we all have range of motion. 
you know, do you have control over that range of motion though is what I ask, you know, majority of all my clients. So like, uh, I use the, the example, my fighters are, have great strength, but they don't have a lot of range of motion because their muscles are so tight, mm. you know, until they're warmed up and then they get into their certain positions, right? And then they're good in a butterfly or whatever, you know, position they put themselves into. My dancers on the other end, highly flexible, no strength, mm. right? So my dancers now, they have, you know, a lot of flexibility, but they don't have control over their end range of flexibility. So I have a kid right now, high level dancer, stretching his right leg over his head, left knee just buckles. Tore his patella tendon, fractured oh, wow. you know, the femur, and all he was doing was doing a natural little stretch. But it was like he was doing the splits with his right leg up above his head. You know, well, what happened? He lost control over that knee, and the knee just buckled. Well, how many thousands of times had he had done that in the past? You know, and now this one time, just boom, see you later. So now we're teaching him control. As we're teaching him control, he's struggling because he's still highly flexible, you know, as as his dancer. But he doesn't have control over those end wow. ranges of motion. Strength in it, right? So this Definitely. reminds me of. Uh, I actually think we did a. We did. We did do a, a YouTube video on this. The ninety ninety. Uh, yeah. Like foot and heel lift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That particular video. I think it was like number six or whatever, seven. Um, this was a trip. We had actually gone off to write some programming with uh, with Doctor Brink, and he put uh, me in a ninety ninety position. Now ninety ninety is when you're sitting on the floor. One leg is out in front of you, one leg is out behind you, and they're both bent at 90 degrees. So if it's correct, if you can kind of imagine that one's into external, one's into internal rotation. Yeah, so so uh, so one foot's behind me, one foot's yep. in front of me. And he told me to rotate my back leg so that my foot comes off the floor while keeping my knee in contact with the floor. And I was able to lift my foot off the floor maybe a half an inch or an inch, like barely hover, hover it. And I'm like struggling, right? I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm squeezing and lifting and he's telling me, okay, lift it higher, lift it higher, lift it higher, drive your knee to the floor, lift it higher. And I just can't, like that's it. I'm getting, you're getting an inch and you're not getting any more. There's nothing else. And, you know, he's, and then he asked me like, why can't you go up any higher? And I said, well, I don't, I don't, I don't have, range of motion. I said, yeah. I don't have that range of motion. And he goes, actually, you do have that range of motion. He says, go mm-hmm. get back in 90-90. So I get back into 90-90. He takes my foot and Bends he like a two feet and further. he rotates <laughs> internally rotates my hip so like my foot I mean Man. I could have fucking smelled my own foot it was like <laughs> way up here and it was fucking weird it was weird to see my leg up there because it looked like it was almost scary like uh am I am I hurt <laughs> there was no pain Did it you was rip it off yeah there was no it was very eerie to see that but what he had proved to me was that I have that rota- that that range of motion I just can't do it. I just don't have the control within it. So one of the things that Brink showed us was, you know, you control. Try first work within the range of motion that you have. So I did. I would lift my foot up an inch off the floor, and I'd really just focus on trying to get it even higher and higher. And I couldn't, but just to try, right? That's part of connection, yeah. just yeah, to try. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Then the second thing I would do is I would use a pillow or something to lift my foot up just a little bit higher. So now I'm outside of the my control right like i have the range of motion i can sit with my foot there but i can't lift it there myself now i'm in that position and then what i do is i try to hold my foot there Mm -hmm. while pulling the pillow out from underneath it and the first few times i did it like my foot would just drop every single time but little by little i was able to support my foot within that new that new range range of motion so how, is that then? I mean, that's a great technique. I guess you can apply to pretty much anything, sure, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's anything. to get in a new range of motion, supported by someone or something like the wall or the floor or somebody holding your arm or leg out, and yeah. then try to connect to it. So then, when they let go, you can do it on your own. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. okay. So I was. Yeah. I've gained quite a bit of range of motion there. I couldn't barely even get my like Sal. I couldn't barely get my foot up there. I can actually get my foot a good solid, probably foot and a half, two feet off the ground. Now. It's weird. It's a, such yeah. a weird feeling. To feel your body become connected in a new way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's the same muscle, same muscle, same movement. Everything's the same. You have connection. And that's the thing about muscles that I think people need to realize that I didn't realize. I didn't realize this either. It's such a revolutionary concept. I think it's... I mean, it's it's been around. It's just like we're we're, we're coming back to it because we're realizing like... We understand it better. Yeah, we understand it better and a better way to teach it. And also like... If you think of of sports injuries and just like different ranges of motion, like on that level, there there's techniques like this that 
it, you can actually prevent a lot of these injuries or like build strength in positions where you know you're not just in a fixed kind of squat position like you're you're expressing your 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 width of your feet a little bit further like there's just there's just more you can do to kind of pre uh prevent and prep your body better to to handle like different forces and different ways of 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 adjusting and and and, and operating and optimally so well and i, I think like sal was just saying is you know, he had great range of motion through his hip. He just didn't have the connectivity to his hip to be able to allow his foot to go into that range of motion because he's never trained there, Yeah. yeah. right? You know, you do jiu-jitsu or you've done it in the past, right? It's all external. Yeah, your body was always into external rotation, so it never had to go into internal rotation. Mm-hmm. So you look at kids, kids own, for the most part, all their range of motion. Yeah. They're out there playing they're on jungle all gyms kinds of stuff. all day long. Yeah, free right? form. So, yeah, yeah. So their yeah. hips are always moving into internal and external range of motion. So when they do sit in a squat position – it doesn't hurt them. Mm-hmm. I just read an article. I actually just posted it on our forum uh, this morning. On uh, I googled um, hunter I gatherer. Yeah, Did yeah, you yeah. see it? I saw the bone. Yeah. So I, I, I there's two. Yeah, those two articles I yeah. posted. So I, I looked up hunter gatherer feet, and then I hit uh, images because I wanted Probably some ugly ass feet. <laughs> not, not well. You know what's funny, dude? We have ugly feet. Yeah. We're just used to our ugly ass deformed feet, and so we think their feet are ugly. Uh, when in reality, when in reality, it's we, a trip. I don't even have to see. I've seen it before. They have their feet are all spread. Their, their toes their, are all spread apart. Their, their toes are spread. Their feet are muscular looking. You can tell that their feet are functional. Then when you look at a foot like ours, we have atrophied, weak, uh, deformed feet, mm-hmm. toes going off to the left and the right because of the shoes that we wear, like all this crazy stuff. All smashed together. So I looked it up, and uh, I'm looking at all these pictures because I was going to do a post. So I was going to take, I was going to rip one of these off the internet and do a post about it. And I saw this article where I guess there was a, a, a study with some anthropologists who went and studied some of these hunter gatherer societies, and they were looking at their abilities to move, how they moved, and how much, how different it was from the way that we could move uh, as modern humans. And in this one particular tribe, the people uh, were tree climbers. So they could climb trees and they would get honey and fruit. And during the rainy season, this is kind of cool too, a little side fact. In the rainy season, this particular group of people got up to 80% of their calories from honey. So that's what they did during certain wow. seasons because it was plentiful. They'd go up there. And, it's a lot of bee stings. Uh, but they were showing <laughs> – but they climbed, these, they climbed these trees, which are – uh, I don't. I don't know. They're not like palm trees, but they're kind of not huge, huge. Uh, um, not a huge tree trunk, but where they can kind of reach around it. But they climb it like a chimp does, where it's almost like they're walking up the tree with their feet, with with their hands around the back of it. Mm-hmm. And they were demonstrating a dorsiflexion. That is that flexion or extension? Am I going? That's extension. There. Sorry. Well, Dor- uh, uh, with the foot. That's dorsi. There yep. you go. Yep. So they were demonstrating uh, a flexion at the ankle. That was at a degree that would break most people's ankles. Well, think about that. Like if, you're, could, if you're climbing up a tree wow. and you need your foot here, my knee is going to be pretty close to the tree. Or that's what they were able to do. They were able to get their knees really close to the to the to the tree and, get and have foot all nice and most of their there. yeah wow. most of their foot was on the tree and they're that's just crazy. They're just bop, 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 climbing it's not just all the, the, the yeah because you'd think it was just like their toes and uh, they're getting most of their foot on there. And well, so, it's what it's what a chimp looks like yeah. when they climb it. And right so now. what they did was is they examined their gastrox and their soleus and they found that their fibers within their calves were much longer mm-hmm. than in the average person and it wasn't because they were they had some genetic like advantage it's because this is what they did in fact the well, youngest, I was just going to say did you do you think they adapted that way no, and or no you, because that's what this question that they asked and they showed that cuz the younger generation within this tribe stopped climbing trees so much cuz i think they were starting to get some of these foods from other areas mm-hmm. and so the best climbers in the tribe were the old men because they were the last they generation to really climb that way, so kind of trip off. So that what? Kind of so shit. tell me what happened then. What happened to their 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 gastroc and soleus? Did it the fibers shorten, or did they did they did they actually change? No, well, no. The reason why they had longer fibers was because they had been climbing trees since they were children, and their bodies had adapted to that. Had ad- learned how to do yeah. it. That's what I'm saying. So the other generate the other yeah, more normal. Okay. More like the average person. Although they all had great. I'm sure. Well, they like, all had great right, feet. You talking about the feet? I mean, think of a sports car. Right, the faster the car is, it the more narrow the tire or the thicker the tire? Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. same thing. If we want to run faster, we want more surface area. 
Or it's like if you were to do a handstand on the ground, do you put your <laughs> fingers together? Or do you open up your hands? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, so, but in society, we want these nice, narrow, slender feet and we wonder why our feet suck. Well, well so, <laughs> yeah. so here's an interesting one for me, even is uh, I, I did yoga for a very short period of time, but one of the things that happened to me when doing yoga is because there was all these downward positions was that my wrist, my left one in particular, would hurt at the at the top of the wrist where, where the back of my hand meets my 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 arm. And I, it would hurt, and I couldn't figure it out, so I started using my fist, and I'd grab something, and I tried all these props. And then I noticed one day when I was in Downward Dog that if I pulled my fingers up, like I was trying to get my fingers off the, off the floor, or actually put my, my, my wrist mm-hmm. into extension even more, the pain would go away. Like I activated mm. some of the muscles that were there. And then I started realizing like, oh shit, I just got to like, don't relax in that position. Like learn how to be active. Yeah. Well, so like the trip position. with the combat position where you have yeah. those pulling those toes up. Yeah, like, yeah. I wish I would have known that. That's like, video nine. Through, well, yeah. Like, I mean, as far as addressing things like that constant uh, pounding, you know, on the ground, like having like shin splints and having yeah. all these different things I'm not connected to, it becomes a inflammatory almost. Sure. So yeah. what what is happening, Brink, on a, like on a neurological level or like, what, okay, so like that, you know what I put together? Same thing with my hips. So I've got like bursitis in my hips. And when I sit and drive in a car for like an hour or longer, it just, oh man, it feels like someone is taking a knife and just sticking it in the side of, and I have to get out and go move. Mm-hmm. But if I fucking do my due diligence and I actually do some of my movements before I sit in that car. Mm, you to- prime it ahead of time? That, yeah. Exactly. So I'll, I'll, be, I'll be doing all this internal, external, uh, internal and external rotation of my hips and I'll take it to the both, it yeah. ends of extreme and just intensify it as hard as I can and then internally rotate and intensify as hard as I can. I do that four or five times, get in the car, fucking fine. Mm. What is happening? Well, then? remember, you're you're changing tissue tension. You're changing the loads, right? You just sat for an hour. Your hip didn't move. It sat on the gas pedal and the brake, yeah. gas pedal brake, right? So as your body sat there, I mean, you've started to create some tissue change. And so now, whether it's in a good position or bad position, your body's letting you know. You Which know, is probably is, in a bad because I'm sitting in a car. So that's not- Sure. A, I mean, that's enough. that's everyone. I mean, my job is to tell all the desk jockeys, move. Yeah. Every 15, 20 minutes, get your butt get up and up go and move. Do something, yeah. You know, just uh, whether it's for 10 seconds or 30 seconds, I don't care what it is, just shake your body out. So yeah. then what am I doing then when I, if I actually take the time to prime my body like I do and then go on my, the car ride and it doesn't bother me? What, is, what, what, am, I, what am I doing by doing You're that? You're just probably sending a better signal to your hip saying, hey, we're going to turn on. We're going to activate. We're, we're working. You know, working how we're supposed to versus okay. not doing anything. Thing, and it's just hanging out. Do you also, Adam, when you're in the car and you're sitting uh, there, do you also try to activate the without moving your? Obviously, you're driving, so you can't like swing your leg out and stuff. But do you ever sit there and just try to activate the internal external rotators just to? Oh yeah, fire them while oh, you're driving. Yeah, yeah. And that makes a big difference. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I'm I'm doing before and after and during. Is like when I'm aware of it and I'm trying to stay on top of it, no problem. But well, if I just get in my car, is it your right hip or left hip? It's it's my right. Well, so so think yeah. about think about that. Right, we talk about the foot exercises, yeah. which you create a short foot, which creates connectivity to your hip. Yeah. Right. When you're doing any other movement that you choose. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you're sitting in a car, and what's the movement that you're doing? Gas pedal. Gas pedal. But you're now working yeah. your foot. Yeah. So now you're creating a fascial line tension. Right mm-hmm. on an anterior fascial mm-hmm. line or a posterior fascial line that's now causing tension up in your hip that you're causing pressure in because you're sitting. And if you have a gangster lean or whatever as well, right now you're putting <laughs> yeah, a little totally. more tension yeah. into that hip. So why? Yeah, because your left hip is doing the same thing as your right one. It's just not doing gas. He yeah. shoots his gun right? sideways. So now all of a sudden that right hip is taking. So it's the, the brunt. tension line that's happening. Yeah. You're, so you're probably creating a lot more fascial tension right through there, which is sending all that signal to your hip. Which now that makes more sense. Why me doing the priming is really helping it. Yep. Because now I'm you're wa- unwinding yeah, that fascial right? tension. I'm waking it all up, stretching it out, and then yep. I'm going in there, and then I'm doing that, so it's not it's not put, causing that yep. tension. Yep. Ah, makes a lot of sense now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's interesting, right? Because I think we're it's coming together like butt cheeks. I right? know. You know? <laughs> Sometimes they come apart. <laughs> I You've think, been healed! <laughs> I think uh, it's interesting because we're taking exercise and we're taking it back to what it really is, which is... Fundamental movement. It's, it's, it's movement, and it's movement. Like all movement, you practice it. Yep. And you get better at it. I think when we, and this is the, the of course, we're going to get a little esoteric here, but, you know, uh, the part of the problem with fitness and exercises is that it's so aesthetically driven that we forget that. 
all we think about is the what mm. it makes me look like after. And muscles are there for a reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know exactly. It's yeah. not just there for not looks. Just looks dude. In fact, it's not even there for looks. It's, no. it's at all. It's, there to, it's all in our head. It's there to do <laughs> something else. Yeah. But I and, guarantee those guys climbing the climbing the tree. Look, they good. weren't big muscle muscle bound dudes either. No, they were long, See, lean. You point. know, they so. looked, Have you ever looked at pictures? I could Google it right now. You ever see? There's some old pictures of. Uh, like uh, hunter gatherers or aborigines or whatever, and these men are like in their fifties and sixties. Yeah. They look like me. Yeah, yeah. They look like, and I lift weights all the time, and I'm like trying to be lean or whatever, and they fucking just yeah. sitting there. And I know they've never even seen a weight in their entire life. Right. I mean, it's I, pretty amazing stuff. I told a buddy of mine, Ricky, you know, the other day because he was asking about you know same sort of stuff, and I said, I want you to go out and just play in a jungle gym for fifty five minutes. And I'm like, I bet you're cooked in 10. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's like, but I can do a wad. I'm like, I know you can. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, but you can't do anything that's truly functional. Uh-huh. I was like, I think fitness has. Oh, wow. What has, a smack in the face has, for the CrossFitter has, who's been fucking has, kicking ass yeah. at his wads, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, well, it's specialized. But, but what's, what's awesome yeah. is he's taken that to the next level, and he is now definitely working on all of his mobility, functionality stuff, and he's now trying to work out and do that, which is amazing to see, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and just sort of watch that transformation. But it's like you look at us as a fitness-driven society, like Sal was saying, is we are so aesthetically driven. What does aesthetics give you if you still suck at movement? Well, if you're still in pain, I don't care what you look like. You still have back pain. You still have a neck issue. You have a bad shoulder. You still don't do what you're supposed well, to be doing. Well, I'll be the first one to admit that. I mean, I said, I've said i been saying that on this show for fucking two years plus now is that when I was in the best aesthetic shape of my life, I was probably some of the furthest away from being in the best physical actual shape uh, or functional shape of my life because I was so aesthetically driven that I neglected all this stuff. It didn't matter to you me. Didn't how didn't pay my, attention to any of it. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't paying attention to it. I was I was too busy weighing and measuring and counting calories and making sure I'm burning X amount and building X amount that I wasn't paying attention to how well I was performing anything. And then and now you look at my physique now, my physique now compared to what it looked then, to the average eye who's looking at it would think, oh my God, the other guy looks so much better, but I'm way better shape as far as functional, it, no pain, I'll tell you moving what, better. I'll tell you what, training with just aesthetics in mind creates a disconnect between the mind and the body. And we, we, we forget that there's a very strong connection between the mind and the body. In fact, it's all one and the same. And if you don't believe me, the number one place where you have serotonin receptors is in your brain, and the second place is in your gut. Yeah. Your gut has a tremendous amount. This is where you feel shit in your gut. By the way, there's another place you have a lots of these other types of uh, neuronal receptors. Heart. Your heart. Yeah. This is why you feel shit in your heart. It's crazy. You actually think in your body, not just in your brain. And we, we, we sever the two, and we think that they're different. And when we just focus on aesthetics, where we just train the body to look a particular way, we're actually creating problems with everything else, not just the way we move, but even the way we think. I talked about this with the guys yesterday off air that I just learned this the other day. This is fucking fascinating. Did you know that when they give people Botox treatments on their frown lines, that their rates of depression uh, go down because they can't frown as much? But there's, also, but there's also the side effect of they also lose their ability to empathize. Yeah. They so can't smile either. This is this is a, this is actually this is a real thing. They're actually studying this that what people will get like plastic surgery and stuff like that. What's the effect on the psyche independent of the fact that you that you look different? And they're finding in fact that by making faces or not making faces or altering the way we look and the way we move, it affects the way we fucking think. It's this it's this uh, this whole feedback loop. Everything's connected. It's all connected. And so when we view exercise just for aesthetics, what you're doing, and I know this because I was this way as well, you are training, you're actually strengthening a disconnect between the two because what you're doing with your body- Ooh, God, think about that, right? You are, you are creating a, a very, very strong disconnect to the point where, and it might, it might even rival the disconnect of the couch potato because the couch potato is disconnected because they just don't do shit with they're their body. Un- they're just completely unaware. The guy who lifts, the guy and girl who just- Thinks he's aware. Yeah, they, they're just working out to look a particular way, and that may involve- you know, using, you know, anabolic hormones or, or supplements. It may involve, you know, for the woman implants and other kinds of things. You are creating this separate entity of this body that just looks uh, a particular way. Well, don't and they have that, that Netflix, the physique or something? Like that? Isn't there oh, that, that show on that? Which yeah. is that realm, you know, yeah. uh, of things. And you're, well, this and you're what, disconnecting this what, from it. This is what I got. So the other day I went on a rant because somebody asked a question about um, competing. And, oh, what do you do during contest prep? when you fall off the wagon and you binge or whatever like that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, 
I was talking about that you have we have no business competing at an elite level or doing a sport if you haven't like done the fundamentals first. Like otherwise, and I love I think that's why I brought this up because what Sal's saying, this is where it's so true. You're actually creating more dysfunction, a bigger issue, more problems because you think you're aware or you think you're doing the things that are right, but you're really not. You're getting further away from the truth on how the body should move and what you should be doing. And it's like you first should learn that. You need to understand and, and understand your body and what you're not doing, the functional things that you're not like if you can't sit down in a squat, like that right there should be like, let's figure that out. Let's- and, I, and I post that, you know, on the forum quite often. Right. A lot of the same stuff. I have my movement pre- prerequisites that I throw up there. Someone asks me something, it's like, uh, if something's wrong here, check A, B, and C first. Right. You know, does that make sense? You want to sit there and load your body with all this crazy weight, but yet you can't even squat with no weight. Yeah. Now, the irony of all this is for the vast majority, and I, I'm telling you this with as, all the experience I have as a personal trainer, and I guarantee you these guys will back me up. For the vast majority of people listening right now, if you viewed movement and exercise uh, in the ways that they should be viewed, in which you're trying to get your body to move optimally in these fundamental ways and patterns and different planes of motion, the awesome side effect of that is you're going to look incredible. That's you, you. It's hard to find someone that can move in, in, in all these amazing ways with good connectivity in all these different ranges of motion who doesn't look like they really work out. So that's one of the side effects of it. Yep. Now, on the flip side, if I train just for aesthetics, I can get an aesthetic physique. But the side effect of that is disconnection to my body. It's it's severing the mind-body link. It's actually cr- putting a wedge between the two and causing lots and lots of problems, not just physical problems, but like I said, they're now showing that there's mental issues that can, that can arise from not being able to move a particular way. I see these bodybuilders in the gym who move like they're like they're full of cement because they're so stiff and their shoulders are rounded <laughs> forward. I'm, I'm, I, hey, you know, man. I yeah. can't wipe my ass yeah. uh, movement. Yeah. I'm telling you that will have an effect on their mood, on their personality, and the way they think. And science has confirmed this. Power postures. Look up the science for power postures. Yeah. When they put people in particular positions, they can measure in real time like – Certain hormones are going down, other ones are going up, and we've got these feel-good chemicals coming out, and to the point now where you got Fortune 500 companies that are investing money in some of these positions so that they can get their employees to perform better. Well, so here's the deal. This is why we did this. So here's your your takeaways. Here's what you do right now. Right now, you go over to YouTube. You subscribe to the Mind Pump TV. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, something's wrong with you. Seriously. Well. A new video every day, and, and they're awesome. But this is what we're trying what to- What the hell, man? I mean, something we've always promised when we when we created this business is it'll always be evolving, it'll always be changing, and we're always trying to get better. We're always trying to provide more for you guys. And yeah. so we started to put together series that kind of coincide with some of the podcasts that we talk about. So- you know, we wanted to address the squat. We wanted to also give people things that they can actually take and go apply to help improve that. So if you are not able to sit down in a squat all the way down like a baby, go on there, follow this series. Please comment. Yeah. Tell us things that helped tell out. Us what you like or yeah, or what we could improve on for sure. Like we'll we'll respond to that. That's right. So that's what we're trying to do with it. If it if it if it helped, if it's something that helped you. Share it. Yeah, let share us know it, about it. Share it with somebody. Share it with somebody else. Keep it going. This is something that uh, we'll continue to evolve, and we'll continue to be doing more podcast episodes where we can give and help you guys out. It's totally free. Go to the Mind Pump TV YouTube and subscribe. That's it. Also, uh, if you want to ask us questions that we can answer in our Qua episodes, the place to do it is on our Instagram page. You can find us at Mind Pump Media. Now we all also have personal pages where we provide information, and sometimes we offer some pretty cool uh, coupon codes and stuff like that. My personal page is at Mind Pump Sal. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Matt's Anabolic, Matt's Performance, and Matt's Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. 
The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.